Hi, my name is uh, Susan, and I'm happy to welcome Bill Sharp today to our webinar. This is the third webinar in our Tools for Transformation webinar series. Um, many of you probably know that Alia brings together some big ideas about working with um, uncertainty, working for transformational change, multi-stakeholder collaboration, and all those big ideas get pretty juicy and tough when you're actually working. We'll bring together some of the tools and frameworks that are helpful that way, and case studies, practical work on the ground that helps to illuminate how that's working and, and how people can navigate um, through their own situation. So. Bill is new to the ALIA community. He's going to be coming to ALIA Europe Leadership Intention Intensive next month. Uh, so we thought that this would be a great way to introduce him to the ALIA community and to learn a little bit about his work and the work of the International Futures um, Forum, the IFF. So with his um, IFF colleagues, Bill has pioneered the approach called Three Horizons uh, which is used for convening conversations about the future and creating the conditions for transformative innovation. He's an innovative futures expert and researcher in science, technology, he was a research lab director in Hewlett Packard for 15 years where he pioneered new technologies in mobile and pervasive computing. On leaving HP, he co-founded a specialist innovation consultancy, creating new digital products for international clients and launched two startups. He's been the author of Economies of Life, Patterns of Health and Wealth, and more recently, uh, this book that you see the cover of on your screen here, Three Horizons, Patterning of Hope. So I'm delighted to welcome you, Bill, and look forward to hearing more about the Three Horizons um, Tools for Transformation today. Thanks, Susan. Um, it's a real privilege to be talking to the Alia Network, and I'm really looking forward to meeting more of you in person in, um, in the event in the Netherlands. At the moment, you're all reduced to the, the light. a strange way to meet people for the first time. Um, I should say clearly how I want to offer this to you all. You're all, I'm sure, sort of people who would come to something like this, people with your own deep expertise in transformation, your own practice that you take to other people. And what I'm offering you is something that could be looked at in two ways. One is it's another tool to put into your toolkit, uh, to put alongside all the others that you have expertise in. But what's begun to emerge with Three Horizons is that it's a very helpful way to create a setting in which many different tools can be applied. And I'll say more about that as time go, we go through this. Um, but I invite you just to see how your own practice might be brought into the setting that Three Horizons creates. And its particular value in that is its simplicity. The reason we're putting some effort into this in the International Futures Forum is that this has just emerged out of work we were doing, but we found more and more people just picking it up and using it, and that speaks to the fact that it is so easy for people to understand and, and put into practice. But underneath that simplicity, it seems to have a, a surprising amount of, of power. So let's just get into the slides we've got here. Um, is that going to do what it needs to do? Um, there we go. Um, three Horizons is a metaphor. It, puts us in the role of standing and looking out to sea or looking out to the mountains. And it's working on transformation in a, in a simple linear way, first of all, which is everyone's familiar with the idea of the, the near term, the mid term, and the long term. And that's a quite conventional way and is the way the first use of Three Horizons um, got published around the linear understanding of time. But it has a, a deeper way of working in which we move on and think about time not just in linear terms but as three different ways that we relate to the future in the present. Again, if you think of yourself standing in a landscape, then in some ways the remote landscape probably makes itself felt 
right where you are. If there are mountains in the distance, then the rivers that flow from them uh, will be visible around you where you are. And the critical thing about Three Horizons is it brings this sort of three-dimensional view to working with the future. Instead of the one-dimensional one that we've got the, the, the here, the future, um, just spreading out in front of us, we look to the three horizons as all being there in the present moment and being represented by the different ways that people relate to the future in the present. So that's what's represented by this diagram, that each of the three horizons um, is represented by a different outlook on the future uh, that you see in the, in the figures on the left. So along the bottom axis we have the, the conventional one of time, quite obviously, um, and up the left hand side we label the axis with this word prevalence. And what that's meant to capture is that we look at change quite simply as a change in the dominant pattern of our lives. From the first horizon, which is the dominant way we're getting things done now, to the future pattern, which is the third horizon, and going through some sort of transition. And in looking at that, looking outwards, we also look at that as the way that the actors all around us, including ourselves, are acting in the present moment, either to sustain the first horizon, to have a vision and pioneer the third horizon, or perhaps make an entrepreneurial move in terms of establishing the second horizon. So I'll just run through those now in a little more detail. The first horizon is whatever in our area of concern is the dominant way things are getting done today. And we look at it as a pattern, not just as a state of affairs, but as a, a pattern that pres preserves itself. And the easy way to know when you've got a pattern is if you're trying to change something and it resists, um, then you know you've found the pattern that, you, that is your area of concern. And that's why the term locked in is quite often used to describe the dominant first horizon pattern. It's got a dynamic quality to it that is preserving itself. And of course, that's not necessarily bad. We can only live our lives because things are predictable and work the way we expect them to work, like the networks that we're relying on or the, uh, the rules of the road or, or whatever it is that we rely on day to day. It's also important and very helpful to realize that the first horizon itself has a pattern of innovation. It's quite easy to get into the mode that every, everything that we need to do requires innovation and all innovation is going to change things. But one of the difficult things to work with is that the first horizon has its own pattern of innovation that's incremental and will do its best to hold on to all the new things and apply them within, within its, own, its own model. I mean, if you think about how the PC desktop model kept going for quite a long time is the major way that computing was organized and is only slowly giving way to the more web-centered view that, you know, that might be regarded as a third horizon. The experience of time in the first horizon is the one that we're all pretty familiar with when we're working as a project manager, when we've got something to get done, we've got a plan and a tick list, and there's a really, there's a real sense that you allocate time as, a, as one of the resources that you've got to manage. So we call the first horizon a managerial mindset. It has that feeling of being responsible, managing the resources, getting the job, doing the next release. When we're working with three horizons, it always helps to go, instead of going one, two, three, to go one, three, two. So the third horizon draws its time horizon from when things will be different. And we're in a three horizon discussion because in some sense, the people having it say the first horizon is losing its fit. It's no longer working in the way that we think it should. We can see conditions changing around it and it's gradually losing its strategic fit to the future. So what we find is, and with Google and web searching, you can do it easily now. If you start to think about any way the future might be different and respond to the challenges of the declining first horizon, you'll always find some people out there, pockets of future in the present, who are doing their best to respond to the limitations and bring something new into being. And that's the transformative innovation. It's going to be found on the margin, people who have just decided to to move away from the dominant pattern and do something different. In highly organized areas of research, you'll find it in the research labs of universities and big companies, or in society, you'll just find it with people going out, striking out, doing something different, maybe in a different part of the world or well away from where the mainstream dominates. 
the experience of time here is rather different. I call it time as the defining moment. Somebody who stands out for a vision, for a new way that things should be done. It's time as taking a decision. Time is the defining moment. It might be something relatively mundane, like trying to pioneer a whole new way of a whole new product category, or it might really be something, you know, quite life defining, as we see on the streets around the world in many places. Somebody simply taking a stand and saying the old ways is no longer the future, and standing out and trying to embody that in the way. So that's a visionary mindset. And I think you can see the experience of time is quite different. A decision, a decision to stand for something doesn't use time as a resource, it uses it as, as a moment of, of defining destiny. Now in between the two, well obviously the second horizon is going to be turbulent. There are many competing visions of the future, many attempts to start new things. Not all of them will work, many of them will just be, be out there and then fail. And the second horizon is, is inherently ambiguous. Is it going to be something that will fall back to the first, be appropriated and used by the first horizon system to extend its life, or, or will it be a stepping stone into the future? So the mindset here is fundamentally entrepreneurial, and you know what it feels like to be an entrepreneur. You've got to choose your moment. If you do it to move too soon, uh, the, the market isn't ready, people aren't, aren't going to respond, leave it too late, maybe the opportunity is completely gone. Is that one we all have of opportunity, the, the, the moment that you must, you must strike while the iron is hot? So we call this, say, the entrepreneurial mindset. And I'd just like to say a bit more about the, this sort of ambiguity. One of the very useful distinctions we've found to make with three horizons is between what we call H2 plus and H2 minus. When, when a new innovation comes out, then it's a real question about does, whether the first horizon will find some way to pick it up and run with it, or whether it will become a stepping stone into the third horizon. And if you yourself are trying to bring about a change, then it's a really good question to ask about which way it's going to go. Um, an interesting example that came up um, in some work I was doing on, on transport in cities was, was hybrid cars. Now, at one level, hybrid cars are a really good idea. Um, they get further on less fuel. But one of the problems is that if you don't change the attitudes of the people who buy them and drive them, uh, then they can just be used to buy a bigger car and drive further uh, for the same amount of money. So in some ways, the hybrid car can result in a continuation of first horizon patterns and even make them worse in that people might choose to live further from work and travel further every day. So if your goal was to achieve a shift to sustainable transport, you might find that you're not getting what you want. On the other hand, from the point of view of the manufacturer, it's, it's a way of sort of working with both sides of the second horizon. Um, it can appeal to existing drivers um, who maybe aren't ready for a shift to full electric cars, but it's causing a lot of things to come into place. It's a way to pioneer and develop a lot of the technologies that will be needed in a shift to, uh, to the third horizon, sustainable transport, electric cars, and so on. So it's a very flexible way of, of working, the, the three horizons. I'm going to pause here for questions, um, and then we'll go on a bit more into how you convene these sorts of discussions um, and, the, and the way that you can then turn it into an actual project plan. So I'll just pause here and, and take some questions, Susan, on, on the basic model. Please just go ahead and ask any questions that you have of Bill. But um, in the meantime, Bill, could you talk maybe a little bit about this, this in-between zone, this, the second horizon, and it can go either way, what I heard you saying, the plus yeah. or the minus. Is there, a, is there a sense in there that, you know, that saying, first you make the tools and then the tools make you, that innovations can actually shift mindsets from first to third horizon? just by virtue of the way they shape a different um, way of relating to systems? Yeah, I think, um, I think the thing to be alive to is that they can, but that they might not. So you may think that the tool, that the new innovation you're bringing out will quite naturally lead people to change their, their norms and their behaviours, um, and it may or it may not. The, the hybrid car was an example that quite a lot of efficiency technologies that are introduced to help us you know, 
hit the carbon out of the atmosphere to move to a more sustainable world can also be appropriated to increase demand and that can that can be quite difficult um, so a, a different case would be say online music and, and peer music the norm the norm in downloading has been for people to expect music to be free so in that case there was a very rapid shift in behavior enabled by the technology and we're still in a very ambiguous world where it's not clear exactly how all of that's going to settle down we've got a, a big shift in norms with people expecting a large amount of content to be freely available and it's not always clear what people are going to take forward into a new way of paying for things and which things will will not so so that's the case. It is in it is definitely ambiguous at the moment. Okay, thank you. There, there is a question here. Do we always have three horizons to deal with as we move forward? That's Sudir. In the nature of, of what three how three horizons works, the answer is yes. In that, you bring this in to shape a discussion where people are tackling a situation where they feel that the overall way things are getting done now can't reach the future they want. And this is where this distinction between sustaining or incremental innovation and transformative innovation is really important. So many, many systems, many patterns of life have some ability to innovate within them and that's, that's just fine. And if that will reach the future we want, that's okay. But we have a Three Horizons conversation because the new world that we want just, is, just isn't being reached by the first and in fact, the first horizon is probably doing everything it can to stop that change happening. Mm. And then the second horizon just I say, falls as that transitional zone between the two. So yeah, the short answer is yes, for the, for the situations that we're, we're using three horizons, it is three. There's another question, Bill. Maybe you want to take one or two more before you continue yeah, on? Yeah, take a couple okay. more. Uh, Mark Hollingworth here asking, how does this relate to or build on the three horizons originally used by McKinsey in strategic planning? Yeah. The, the three horizons as originally introduced are, that model is primarily a, a linear model of waves of waves of technology in the short, medium and long term. That's the primary way that model is used there. Mm. What you referred what, to at the beginning. More. Yeah. What is the shift which seemed really really quite small at the time just turned out to be really important was this one of seeing them as always present all the time seeing them all co-present um, as you look towards the future and as represented by three different types of behavior so there's the behavior that's keeping the first horizon going and then those who are actively pioneering the second and the third um, and that's quite a small shift, but it's a very important one. That's the fundamental difference. And Margaret Ann is asking um, about the turbulence that you talked about in the second horizon. Yeah. Could you just say yeah. a little more about that? Um, although the picture looks quite simple, um, anyone who's involved in bringing about change know that we, we can't really predict the future. And while we'll have our own ideas of how the future will come about, um, it isn't all invented yet. Um, I lived through the period of the computer industry um, before and after the web was invented. And every big company had its vision of what the information highway was going to look like. And they were all trying to pioneer them, and they were all somewhat different, and they were all in that turbulent zone in the middle. Um, and that and it wasn't until the web itself was actually invented that the new order came out of it. And then at that point, that simple model of the web was enough for all the innovation now to become focused on that model and taking that model forward. And a lot of other investments that have been going on then just, just fell by the wayside. So when you're in the middle of that zone, you don't really know what's going to win. And so it can be quite important to be aware that innovation towards the third horizon often has to keep quite a lot of things open and avoid committing too early. Mm. Now there's a nice example from the way the um, in Germany they set about creating innovation around the shift to renewables with feeding tariffs which I think is a nice example that have an, an H2 plus policy that they wanted to create a shift to 
new renewable technologies, but didn't want to pick the winners and just say what should be invested in. So by creating a market in the feeding te uh, feeding technologies, offering them a competitive tariff, they can allow competition to happen between the different offerings in the renewable technologies. So let the market it, you know, establish the winners, but put them all on the on the far side of the H2 curve, uh, so that the future they would all be competing to make the transition into renewable technologies. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of working productively with with the ambiguity and allowing it to work its way out. Thank you. Um, maybe just one more question for now, and somebody would just like you to clarify what prevalence stands for. Yeah, is it something uh, personal or something we all need to explore? Right. Um, the prevalence just means what's the what's most widespread, what is there most of, what's most prevalent, uh, what's the dominant way things are getting done around here. Um, so the the picture is meant to convey the notion that the first horizon is the dominant pattern for, for the thing we're interested in. Um, as I say in, in transport today it would be the internal combustion engine is the prevalent one. Um, we might imagine that if we're going to change the world of transport then in the future electric vehicles are going to play a very much bigger role and perhaps even become the dominant role. So that would be the third horizon. And, I, and in between, we're going to eventually see a shift from one to the other. So I don't know whether that's true in this case, but the prevalence is just saying, what's the most important pattern in our area of concern? And then the time horizon is, is developed according to seeing over what period of time you think that change might take place between one pattern in the present and the, the other in the future. Thank you. Would you like to continue? OK, OK, let's, let's move on then. One of the most useful things coming out of Three Horizons is the way it helps you have a more constructive conversation amongst people who are thinking about the future. And the way we represent this is in terms of the mindsets that people bring to the, the Three Horizons. I said before that you know, these are three ways people behave and you'll find if you have a Three Horizon conversation that the people in it will usually fairly easily identify whereabouts in that map they're playing. Is their job to keep the current Horizon 1 system going? Do they have a day job that means you know, running the hospital, keeping the school open, managing the network or whatever? Are they an entrepreneur? Are they out there trying to pioneer something new? Or are they pursuing a long-term vision and trying to bring something fundamentally new into being and, they, and they're working on that in a long-term way? And people as they usually self-identify pretty quickly on the topic of of interest where their, their main interest is. Now what can also happen is that people then view themselves, their horizon is in some sense the right one and the other horizons as essentially wrong. And you know, I'd invite you, any of you listening to think, have you ever found yourself, um, let us say, as an entrepreneur pioneering something new, you are the H2 on the right hand side of this, this picture, and you go into a manager who's responsible for the system today and is in charge of all the resources and you say I've got this great new idea and they say yeah that's a great idea but it's just too risky you don't seem to realize what I have to do to keep this this show on the road and you come out of that conversation thinking that person was just really obstructed just just don't they get it or if you're a real visionary and just really want to bring about a completely new approach let us say to healthcare or education and you really can see a totally new way that could be done and you go to the H1 person who's doing it today and they just think you're out for lunch and you come out of that conversation thinking well they're a dinosaur don't they realize that they're you know the way they're doing it just isn't going to be there in the future and between even between h2 and h3 two people who are pioneering something new anyone who's who's been in a startup will know there's often some very heated discussions go on between the entrepreneur the, the manager who's really trying to deliver the first product and the visionary whose idea this was and you know, the H2 entrepreneur thinks the visionary is being a bit impractical about what could be done and the visionary is, is afraid that the, the most important thing in their idea is going to be compromised. So discussions about the future can get really off the rails because each of these positions is, is adopted as a mindset and the nature of a mindset is you don't really realize you've got it. Um, you're, you're so embedded in it that you see it as, as the right point of view. And what we found is with Three Horizons that you can 
but at least attempt to move from mindsets to perspectives. You can start to surface that these are three ways of looking at the world and that we all need some horizon one things to keep going and we all need there to be a future and we all know that sooner or later we have to back something if the new idea if it's going to have a chance of winning. So if people come to this with, with a certain amount of goodwill then the horizon two entrepreneur going to horizon one might say well I know this isn't what you need for today but I need some support from you. I need some elements of what you've already got in Horizon 1 to keep the lights on uh, while we try and try and do the new thing. And the Horizon 1 can see that perhaps what they're doing won't last forever and Horizon 2 is going to be a, a source of new ideas. Horizon 3 visionary can look to people trying something out in Horizon 2 um, as a useful ally and Horizon 2 can look to Horizon 3 as an inspiration. So what we see is that this sort of step is a step into what we like to call sort of future consciousness, a step out of being embedded into any one mindset and an ability to work flexibly with all three horizons as alternative perspectives on the future. And we find that this leads to, in many cases, much more productive discussions. It doesn't mean everyone's going to agree. It doesn't mean we're, uh, you know, we're all going to come together necessarily around a vision of the future, but we can often disagree a lot more effectively. And that's something I always think is really worth having. Um, just moving on, give you sort of an idea of, of what you would do with, with Three Horizons, how it turns into a, a tool. And there'll be some, uh, a link to a, a, a set of slides that turn this into a simple process for you available after the, the webinar. This is a picture of um, a real Three Horizon map. It was built in, in education and with the International Futures Forum has done a lot of work on education in Scotland where it's mainly based and now in fact has a three horizon toolkit in all the schools and it's used by um, head teachers and their staff but also by children to explore education in the 21st century. The main output of a three horizon conversation is a three horizon map and what you do is you, you draw the three lines, three lines on a piece of paper, and you start bringing up topics for discussion. And in our education toolkit, we've got lots of topics that help people explore different aspects of education that might be changing in the 21st century. And the order in which you do it is we first start by identifying some of the things going on in the present pattern and those that are symptoms of a loss of fit to the future. Then you move to the third horizon, so you go, you go to the third horizon as the next step rather than trying to fill in the second. Look for pockets of the future in the present. Look for any examples anywhere in the world where you see people trying these things out that you can maybe even go and look at. If in a big project you can go and do a learning journey and see where maybe some of these things are happening and people are trying them out. Look for some of the innovations, the people really now running with those and trying to put them into, really put them into practice, scale them up, get them to, uh, to take off. And then very importantly is this idea that instead of setting it up as only a competition between the first and third horizon, once you've really begun to, to understand what the future system might be, there's often a very important role for the old H1 um, in the future. Going back to the web example, um, there are still lots of mainframes in the world. Uh, we moved to, you know, onto the desktop was the big revolution, but the mainframes are still there and they turned into web servers. So once you've really got a grip on the future, then you often find that there's a very important set of things that you need to bring from the first horizon in, into this, into this um, third horizon future. So again, I, I thought I'd just pause there and we'll, we'll have some more questions. When I, when I read about this case study in your book, I was, I was impressed by how it gives a sense that everybody has a role to play. That, um, that if you can trans transform those biases that we have about people that they don't get it or they're going too far too fast or whatever into seeing how everybody can become a resource, then that's quite a major shift. Ha yeah. Have you found that in this example in the education system? Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, um, very much very much so. Um, one thing we often say is, you know, everybody's a human being. Um, 
it sounds trivial, but in many situations, people don't feel it's legitimate if they are being measured on delivering in the first horizon. And there are often very severe measures nowadays. It's a very tough world and people have to be very, very focused to deliver what they're expected. Any, even any discussion of the third horizon can often seem as though it's illegitimate, that they aren't allowed to have views and dreams of the future. So one of the functions that Three Horizons seems to play is that it makes it legitimate to, to step outside the current system and explore it in a genuinely open and creative way without feeling that that's necessarily putting the commitment to the existing system in jeopardy. So the fact that you've got this way of organizing this releases people quite a lot. And we also find that um, sometimes the First Horizon turns out to be a hero. Um, that, in fact, somebody's got to keep things going while people explore and put in place some of the things needed for the future. Um, so we found this to be, yeah, to be really quite productive in, in opening up a wider range of possibilities than, than the conventional discussions about, uh, about change often bring into play. And those of you who are familiar with Clayton Christensen's work on disruptive innovation, you know that he started with the paradox that the managers who were who failed to manage disruptive innovation were not bad managers. They were actually managing very well. And the, the, the dilemma was that good Horizon One management means keeping focused, keeping your resources applied to the, to the current system. And so your job is in fact to often kill certain sorts of innovation which distract people and, and threaten to take resources away. So unless you can bring into view that there's a different innovation system that needs its own dedicated resources to bring the third horizon into view, then any attempt to open that up with first horizon can just end up going nowhere. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions here. One is from Libby Dean. What tools do you see as being, whoops, I just lost it in the wrong camera. Um, as being most useful in this mapping, aside from meeting in person and time, what tools are the most useful in this mapping? And somebody else, a related question, just wanting to know more about the actual process that you go through um, and who should be in the room. Right. Um, so part of the advantage of Three Horizons is the tools are really just what you can see in front of you. Um, it's three lines, you know, on a piece of paper. It's a chart on the wall and post-it pads and, and leading a conversation um, in the way that any of you um, would, would facilitate the conversation. So part of its attraction is its simplicity. Um, if you look on the um, International Futures Forum website under the education example, you'll see that we have gone a bit further than that and produced um, a kit that turns it into a sort of game that helps people play it. And, a couple of things there that were good innovations were if you're going to run it with lots of groups was to build up a little stack of cards that preload the discussion with topics for the for the group to work with um, and then a little egg timer uh, that encourages people to spend no more than two or three minutes on each topic so that people move along quite rapidly and then they, they take each point, they discuss it, they write a post-it, and then they think where to put that post-it on the, on the map, and maybe they put a couple in a couple of different places, then somebody else takes a go, uh, and it moves on. So there are one or two little tips like that that help it move along. Um, um, the, but the basic model is a very simple one. Um, the other particular tool it's getting used with more generally is scenarios and scenario planning. And I know you have webinars coming up on that. So it, it has a considerable similarity with the way people use what are called normative scenarios to actually shape a future. Um, but what I'm hearing from quite a few futures practitioners is that they find um, that it works very well to use Three Horizons to start a strategic discussion before they get into scenarios. Scenarios are then very useful for exploring major uncertainties around the third horizon. And then when you've done that, coming back into a three horizon map mm. to start to explore the way that the, the people involved might, might act on it. So that's a, a way of playing the three horizons with, with scenarios. So I hope I, hope I got your question as main points there, but I'll, if not, I'm happy to expand a bit more. Okay, thank you. 
Um, that was a great um, little summary of how this could blend with scenario planning. I, I was wondering about that myself. Um, here's a question from Ruben Nelson. How do you avoid latching onto false or even destructive versions, versions of H3? How do you test for fit or authenticity? Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. Mm. Um, I think if this is where, in fact, scenario practice is, itself is often useful. Um, from my experience, doing a lot of work with scenarios over the years, um, you often, if a group is very locked in on one official view of the future, um, then the way to open up the discussion is not to try and generate lots of futures, but to work on one really strong challenge, to, to bring a lot of evidence to bear on one dimension that, that really challenges underlying assumptions and, and to really get into that and, and get to the point where that sort of, that uncertainty can unlock things. And once you've unlocked the possibility that the future is different, then in my experience, it, it usually goes goes into all possible futures. Uh, you know, I mean, people open it up very, very widely without too much difficulty. And more generally, I think it just speaks to the need when convening a discussion to convene it with people who who bring a mixture of points of view um, into that discussion. So if you set up a discussion that only has um, people who are very embedded in the current system, then their third horizon is probably not going to be terribly ambitious and will tend to be um, a more linear extension of the first in just that that's the next thing and that's the thing after that. So in that sense, you get a sort of horizon one lock-in. So I think it comes down to either the way you convene the team and the participants in it, or the other main mechanism I, I see people using most in transformational work is the learning journey. So mm -hmm. you really put together a carefully constructed journey and take people off to see the pockets of the future in the present. And one of the organizations I'm starting to work with on Three Horizons, that's the major thing they do in their business is they, they take very often big horizon one businesses um, who want to open themselves up and they take them off to parts of the world where they'll see things in a very different way in a very different light and I generally think experiential learning is really the best way to open up people's minds to the future. Mm -hmm. There's a question um, about these pockets of the future. How do you distinguish between those and just innovations that are at play? Not um, Am I clear what the difference is? Yeah, it, it's not sort of a hard and fast uh, distinction, but one the sharpest difference would be a vision might not have any particular time scale on it. Um, people who've just decided that they're going to do things a different way will often go to the margins of society where they can they can try things out um, and, and live in a different way, try something out, start up a new school, start up a new uh, way of life, and they're maybe not trying to champion it to, to society at large, uh, but it's an indicator of, of how things could be different. So it may just be people are just doing something differently, they're not trying to pioneer it or sell it to everyone else, but if you go there and look, you, you can have a conversation and see that, that there's other ways out there of doing things. The nature of the second horizon in that sense then is it's a really deliberate move to go out and try and change the world. It's taking some possibility and trying to get out there and displace the first horizon um, from its current preeminent position. That, that's the difference. And if you look in sort of technology, we actually organize society around those horizons differently. So we put a lot of the third horizon work off in the universities, it used to be corporate labs as well, places where people can just take as long as it takes to find out new things and explore their implications without maybe too much commitment to a particular outcome. Whereas we have venture capitalists um, funding innovations in the second horizon, putting putting the wood behind the arrow for something that may or may not succeed. And I can see a blend of that in the social labs approach, for example. Yeah, yeah, right. One of our earlier um, webinars. Here's a question from Michael Negarif. I'm in healthcare in Canada, and clearly we need this approach in healthcare. I'm wondering how I find groups or people who are using it in my area. Is there an inventory of people or organizations somewhere using this in various places? 
I hope there will be. <laughs> That's not maybe a very helpful answer at this point. In the International Futures Forum, we have an ambition to create around this sort of tool, what we're beginning to call an Open Futures Forum, to make tools available and to create a network amongst practitioners where all the tools are available to people and where case studies can be exchanged and a network of practice can actually be built up. So, so we're, we're planning to do a lot more on that over, over the coming year. Um, in the short term, you know, getting in touch with the IFF through its website would be a start and the more people who do that, the more we'll be able to start creating that network um, amongst people who are interested. And certainly healthcare is a particular area of interest for the International Futures Forum. Um, one area of learning has in fact been between Scotland and Alaska where some very, very innovative things are being done in healthcare. So, mm -hmm. um, if, uh, was that Michael? Um, Michael Negara. Yeah, would like to get in touch with IFF through the website, then I'm sure we can find some way of linking in to conversations. Great. Maybe we should have you over to Canada and do some yeah, 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 healthcare. Yeah, 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 let's do it. Yeah, why not? I'm, I'll just, just say one of the things about yeah. the public sector that we've mentioned education and healthcare. I think one reason that um, a lot of these problems of being felt to be so acute in the public sector is that one way to look at three horizons is to say is there a three horizon system of renewal in place in my area of concern my example of markets and technology there is we have a whole venture capital industry whose whole job is to go and challenge the first horizon and invest in the second and we have whole programs of technology um, exploitation set up around universities so the whole system set up to do that and in healthcare that works up to a point. It works in some of the areas of new products and treatments, but overall, the system maybe hasn't got a very good three horizon renewal system working. So you can step back and say, maybe some of our problems is that the overall system of renewal isn't working, and maybe there are some policy changes we need at the overall level that will help that to ha happen, and maybe we should put in some effort at that level too. Mm -hmm. Margaret Ann is wondering if you're familiar with value stream mapping and how this approach is different from that, if you are. I'm afraid I don't know value stream mapping. Um, the work, I, I could ask a question back. I mean, I relate this a lot to work on value uh, constellations. There was a paper in Harvard Business Review from a close colleague of mine, Rafael Ramirez, with Richard Norman paper that was downloaded a great deal of which was on um, the idea of value constellations um, and that's a very helpful way to look at the shift that happens between horizon one and horizon three which is a shift in the dominant value constellations but I mean if, if the questioner would like to say a little more about what the question is I'll try and answer it but I'm afraid I don't know that that work So please, you can, we have time for a, a few more, maybe one or two more questions if you have them. And meanwhile, um, I'd just like to make a comment again about your book, um, Bill. I found that it, it was impactful for me on several levels, and I, I sense that there was a lot of reflection behind it, a lot of um, insight, really, about when you talk about different ways of knowing and seeing and relating to uncertainty. And I just wonder if you'd like to share anything about that dimension of this work for you personally, um, how that's connected for you to yeah. the three horizons. Yeah. Work. Um, yeah, maybe start with a little story. Um, I learned to ski when I was an adult. I've done a little bit when I was a child, but I had never had much chance and then I worked in in Boise Idaho in the US for for a while and they have a ski slope just outside town uh, so I had a great chance to learn to ski and the first time I went out there I was feeling obviously a little bit nervous you strap these planks on your feet and get on the ski lift with the ski instructor next to you and just start going up in the air and the ski instructor turned to me and he said my job is to help people love gravity <laughs> and I thought that's really a great way to describe what you're going to do because once you're at the top of a slope you're going to go down and gravity is going to take you there and really the only question is is whether you're going to do it with skill and style and enjoyment or whether you're just going to crash and 
as I've worked on, on futures, um, I've found that really I see my job as helping people to learn to love uncertainty. That when we look to the future, the essence of it is while we may have visions and dreams and desires, we fundamentally don't know. And the more I've looked into it, the more I've realized we don't even really have good words for working with that creative openness of the future. Um, and I've been on lots of futures projects and I've had to review a lot of them in various times. And I find that every futures project always have to, has to come out with some very confident statement about how we're going to solve our problems and what the future is going to be. And that we're very uncomfortable having to face the genuinely unknowable future in a creative way. So what I'm really working with here is how do we develop a skilled ability to work with what we don't know? How do we both hold to what we do know and value it, but work in a skilled way together to create the future that we don't yet have? Um, and I'm finding that, you know, so we don't even really have a very good language for that creative openness towards the future um, that I think we need. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're coming close now, but you, um, in, in the Netherlands, you're going to be bringing one of the case studies. We're going to have a number of uh, case studies yeah. that people can go into in some depth. Yeah. And the um, one that you're going to bring is is from the Scottish education system in yeah. particular. I'm going to bring the this this education example, and I'm going to bring the, the sort of kit that we use um, to enable those conversations. So everyone, because I, th I think this is a topic that almost anybody can have have views on. Um, so we'll be using that as a way to give people an immediate first-hand experience of, of working with Three Horizons. And I, say, I always find people can get into it really quickly and easily. And then we'll work a little more on the three main practices um, around Three Horizons, which is this one of seeing things as patterns, uh, developing that, that way of looking at transformation and change how we put ourselves into the picture, you know, the idea of the mindsets and the perspectives, um, and particularly the idea of creative integrity as the way that we relate our own actions to the, the patterns in play, and then convening the future, um, just how you put this together in terms of, of bringing a, a conversation together around, around the three horizons and creating a three horizons map. So we'll go, go over all those and use the, the education example just as a placeholder for for a sort of project area that we might do. Great. So it would be of interest to people not in education as well. Oh, absolutely. Applicable. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, just to just so as people know, in fact, I I wasn't on the education project in Scotland. Um, that's been done by my colleagues, um, but I, I'm using their material on that. But mo my practice has most often been in things that are more related to science and technology and, okay. and innovation around those areas. That's my mm -hmm. my main expertise in uh, that I bring into it. The interesting thing for me has been that the technology industry changes so fast every 10 years or so that it's like a laboratory. It's like the, it's like the, the lab or act for transformation that has to do this every 10 years or so. And what's been really interesting is how these tools that started off there um, seem to have this much wider um, mm -hmm. impact and use on, on these other fields too. Well, thank you so much. We're going to come back to you in a minute because I want you to talk a little bit just um, say a few words about the subtitle to your book, The Patterning yeah. of Hope. But um, first, we'd like to just share some news about upcoming webinars and events at Alia. So if you could just switch the, the slide and we'll be back to you in just a second. So, so uh, we're happy to announce that we have three new webinars now slated. Caitlin Frost on Transforming Limiting Beliefs in March. Peter Senge, Frontiers of Deep Innovation, his new work with the Academy for Systemic Change, which we're quite excited to hear about, and Adam Kahane, Transformative Scenario Planning, which I think could be um, a nice link to today's webinar as well. So mark those on your calendar and watch your in inbox for invitations to register. And then the next slide is a reminder in case you don't already know about the exciting 
leadership intensives that are coming up. The one in the Netherlands, which we've just been talking about, is just a few weeks away now. Um, if you're nearby, you might still um, have a chance to, to come, or even if you're not. Uh, we have Nora Bateson coming. I'm talking about an, her work with an ecology of mind. Um, Bill will be there among five or six others who are presenting case studies, which you'll have a chance to go into in some depth and get some help applying uh, these models and, and examples to your own work. And Zaid Hassan, you might have joined his last uh, webinar on social labs. He'll be there talking about the Gigaton project, a climate change project. And then in June, um, in Tacoma, which is right near Seattle, June 8th to 13th, we have a wonderful lineup of storytellers, presenters, artists, meditation teachers. Uh, we have Charles Eisenstein coming and talking about his work in new economics, Dan Siegel, neuroscience um, from the Mindsight Institute, Glenda Oyoung, who did the last webinar, and many others bringing, um, bringing not only the case studies, but also leading some of the modules where you can spend uh, two mornings with them going into some depth in terms of different practices that you can apply and strengthen your own leadership. So please go to our website, aliainstitute.org, if you want to find out uh, more about any of those or write to us, info at aliainstitute.org. So once again, Bill, thank you so much. And if you'd like to just say a few words uh, to close, that would be much appreciated. Mm -hmm. I've seen what we're doing here as, at one level, it's quite simple. Here's another tool, as I put it. it. It's one anyone can use, and it's quite simple. But in writing the book and working with my colleagues, we've seen that there is a, a rather bigger goal um, in sight, and it sounds almost too big to be realistic. Um, but that it's recognizing that if we're really to make the sort of levels of transformation that we need in society, that we have to approach it as a form of awareness um, where we cultivate a, a deeper awareness and we cultivate that together um, and I was quite surprised as I wrote the book to find that the term future consciousness hadn't even been used yet um, and so I thought that that in itself speaks to the fact that there's a step we can take here um, which I call an awareness of the future potential of the present moment and then see three horizons just as a very modest small step into developing this as a, as a new level of awareness that we share. And the importance of sharing, I, I draw from the example of language. Language is a uniquely human capability at the level that, that we have it. And you can't have a language just of your own. It is the nature of language that it has to be shared amongst people. That it's not the possession of any one person, but yet every person makes a unique contribution to it. The way I like to put that is that it's a mutual quality of life. And it only gains its power and richness in everything we celebrate in it because it is a completely shared quality of life. When I look at the challenges that we have and the difficulty that we have in achieving all the sorts of transformation that we all know that we need, it seems to me that we have to make some step forward in our self-awareness. And I think in the Alia network, you would be particularly aware of that nature of awareness in, in changing the way that we relate to the world, that the qualities of life that we bring about are, um, relate, are a, a function of the awareness that, that we bring. The way I put this with three horizons is that everyone is a unique source of third horizon potential for transformative change because everyone gives a unique and specific meaning to what it is to be human. Everyone has their own way of asserting the integrity of being human. That's their own form of hope, that there is some way to live that gives full expression. And so I think a transformative society is one which can fully build on that unique potential that everyone has. And what I'm hoping is that with this very modest first step, we might start to move towards that together. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time.